thank Standard Biotools for the opportunity to present the work that's being done in Hart Jackson's lab to you today. And so just as a really brief introduction to mass cytometry technology, um, the innovation of being able to tag antibodies with metal labels, metal isotopes, is really allowing us to move forward from fluorescence-based cytometry and microscopy. And originally, this allowed us to do additional measurements in single cell suspension, but now this is allowing us to acquire high dimension images with many more channels than we could get using standard uh, immunofluorescence. And so if we compare those two technologies, IF with IMC, the strength of IF is really in the amount of cells or the area that you're gonna be able to image based on the ability to tile fields of view together. But within that area, you're really only able to look at a small number of markers. On the flip side, IMC, we can look at up to 40 markers or even over 40 markers in the area that we're imaging, but it is limited by the one micron rasterization size. And so as we try to get larger images, this obviously increases machine time, which directly increases cost. And so improvements have been made um, with multiplexed immunofluorescence. We can now do multiple rounds of immunofluorescence to increase the number of parameters that we're looking at. However, this does increase the time investment um, to do this. With IMC, there have been engineering advances that have allowed it to go faster, as Clinton just discussed. And so this is allowing us to do larger areas in less time, still with those 40 different markers. And so if we look sort of more in depth at those engineering advancements, um, Hart has been around since sort of the inception of imaging mass cytometry. So we have these great videos of the, or pictures of the original alpha unit, um, which is hooked up to a CYTOF-1 and actually used the geology department's laser um, that they use to ablate rocks um, to actually ablate the tissue. And so this could go at 20 hertz. Uh, improvements with gas flow in the beta system, improved sample introduction, and this allowed us to go a whopping 40 hertz. We then have the first commercially available unit, the Hyperion, that got up to 200 hertz. Updates to the Hyperion and the Hyperion Plus that allows it to go up to 400 hertz. And we just heard about the Hyperion XTI and the ability to go at 800 hertz. So if we combine these technology developments with mass spec-based imaging and isotope-labeled antibodies, we have some significant advantages over other imaging techniques. And really this is in the high linear dy dynamic range that doesn't suffer from the same saturation as immunohistochemistry, which interferes with quantification. There's also no autofluorescence. There's minimal focusing issues. It's highly reproducible. If you're titrating your antibodies, there's low channel spillover and it's highly quantitative. Now obviously there are still some challenges that remain. It requires dedicated equipment. Um, the number of markers you're going to be able to use is always going to be limited to the number of available metals. We have that one micron resolution, and overall the technique is destructive. But if we compare imaging to, say, suspension, the advantage really here is that we don't require any sort of tissue dissociation. We're not losing samples. We're not losing antigens during the processing. We also can do small and rare samples, millions of cells per sample, and we can go back into the biobank and look at decades-old tissues. If we look at the staining technique and maybe compare that to cyclic immunofluorescence, this is one cocktail staining. We're staining all of our antibodies at the same time. We're also simultaneously acquiring all of those markers at the same time. We can do this on stable, uh, or sorry, standard pathology slides, and that tissue stain is actually stable. And I think the longest we've gone between staining and actual acquisition is about nine months. And so during Hart's time in the Bowden Miller lab, they established the IMC workflow, and as well looked at what retrospective analysis of spatial organization could tell us. And they were able to show that this could quantify cellular spatial relationships, it could identify spatial features that are associated with outcome, that it contributes single cell data to multimodal data sets, and finally that you could compare cell phenotypes across different tissue sites. And it, recently, um, IMC, the power of IMC has really been harnessed for immune profiling, and we have these three publications that eloquently show that within the last year, and two, the last two were highlighted during Dr. Quayle's talk earlier today. And there are obviously many more and, and more on the way. And so that kind of tells us how we got to here, and so where are we? And that is the Jackson Lab at the Ludenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Um, Hart decided to uh, open his lab in the summer of 2020, which was an amazing time to open a brand new lab. 
not stressful at all in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but in the lab, we do have a Helios and a Hyperion, and we also have an XT, and we have been working with standard biotools on the testing of the Hyperion XTI, though we don't have the fancy new color. So um, if one of the main focuses in the lab is really how do we push this technology forward? And in order to do that, we really need to look at what are the current hurdles that are sort of keeping us from moving things forward. And so we've identified four things. The first is that the areas that we are acquiring are quite small. That if we're doing multimodal measurements, they tend to be on different pieces, either serial sections or different areas of a tumor. There is some bias in how we're putting together our antibody panels. And finally, that we're getting all of this correlative data on spatial organization, cellular neighborhoods, but then we're not really going back and functionally testing it. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm basically going to describe how the Jackson Lab is working to um, advance some of the, or overcome some of these hurdles. And so the first is really in the area that we're acquiring. And so a lot of this is done on tissue microarrays. And these are super helpful. You get lots of uh, patients on, you can get 200 cores on one slide across many different patients. But you can appreciate in this image that a, a small core, and here we're just representing that as 500 micron squared, actually is not capturing a lot of the spatial heterogeneity within this tissue. And so we really want to push the technology to be able to acquire larger and larger images. So we started doing this in the lab. And you can see that now that that TMA core relative to the size of this image is very small. Um, but you can see in the zoomed in areas in one and two that we're still able to find areas of immune infiltration as well as heterogeneity within uh, different markers within the lesion. But if we kind of take that back to the larger image, you can see that those features are not exactly um, common throughout that whole image. And so if we were just sampling small areas of the tissue, even if there were multiple areas, we might still miss this. So the largest image that we have acquired to date in the lab is 10,000 by 6,000 microns. This was acquired on the Hyperion XTI. Uh, it, it took about 20 hours to acquire, and uh, there's about 25 markers in this panel. And you can see that there's significant heterogeneity in this tissue in terms of the quantity of CD45 positive cells. But if we zoom in, even though this image is, is very large, you know, we still have the resolution to look at different areas and see what the infiltration looks like. And because this is IMC, we still have the number of parameters that allows us to specifically look at which immune sub, uh, subtypes or cells, subcells, are um, infiltrating the tissue. So we have another example of this in an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And this really allows us to start to look at the spatial, the rare spatial features and relationships that we can see in these larger images. So in uh, the zoom in on one, that's actually a tertiary lymphoid structure. And this is really important because in this tumor type, that's a key biomarker of immunotherapy response. In two, we're highlighting um, the immune cells in teal. And so you can see that that's predominating in that, uh, in that region. But if we actually zoom back out to the larger image, let's see if I can get this, we have a lot of immune cells out here in the tumor periphery but not nearly as many towards the center. And so that's the kind of spatial relationships that we're starting to see as we're acquiring these larger images. Now, as I mentioned, you can still see um, the heterogeneity, but we can still get the same single cell data from these large images. And here we've just used it to look at different immune cell populations across different sarcoma tumor types. Now, speed just doesn't get us um, larger images. It gets us the results faster. And so this was a pilot study that we did immune profiling on human pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma biopsies. And so these take approximately four hours to acquire. But I think the key metric here is that we were able to go from sample to single cell in less than 36 hours using an automated analysis pipeline from Kieran Campbell's lab also at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute. And so as we um, move forward, if we ever see uh, or envision IMC being a part of a clinical workflow, these types of turnaround times are going to be necessary for clinicians making um, treatment decisions. So if we move on to the multimodal measurements, ideally we want to be able to do these in the same piece of tissue. Um, and so really that comes down to the compatibility of the different workflows um, when we put them together. And so we're doing this with two different uh, combinations in the lab. The first is using um, 
the 4i protocol of cyclic immunofluorescence, basically take large tissue areas and define regions of interest that we can then follow up with high parameter IMC. And so if you have ever done um, cyclic immunofluorescence, you'll know that light is your enemy. So uh, a summer student, Taylor, did this work and basically we forced her to spend her summer in a dark room with a red headlamp. But the result from that was that she was able to do multiple rounds of cyclic immunofluorescence cyclic immunofluorescence, so staining, stripping off the antibodies, staining, stripping off the antibodies. And then at the end of that, she was still able to get um, beautiful IMC data using those same markers that she had done the immunofluorescence for, um, and the tissue uh, integrity actually was maintained throughout this process. And so this is something that we would use if we're not looking to, to generate those gigantic images where we could basically define our populations by IF and then move to IMC just in those regions. The second combination, which has kind of already been discussed a little bit today, is combining spatial transcriptomics with IMC workflow. And so this work has been done in collaboration with Melanie Spears Lab at OICR, and, especially, and we essentially wanted to see if we could combine the geomics RNA protocol with IMC. And so for the geomics protofo protocol, essentially at this first step, you're staining your tissue with UV photocleavable oligonucleotides against your targets of interest. Then you're coming back and you're doing immunofluorescence to define your specific regions of interest. Once you know those, you're using UV to cleave the oligonucleotides just in your regions of interest, and then you're able to collect and count from there. So what we did at the immunofluorescence step is basically added in a cocktail of metal conjugated antibodies, and we wanted to see whether one, this interfered with the geomics workflow at all, and two, how these antibodies would stand up to this first step that involves proteinase K. And you can see here on the right that we have done IMC post-geomics, and we see nice staining of our uh, panel of stromal, epithelial, and immune cell markers um, in this tissue. I will say that I am showing the beautiful images. I didn't show the not beautiful images. Um, this compatibility really needs to be tested um, for all of the antibodies in your panel, as some antibodies um, are still able to bind following the proteinase K, but there are examples where this um, did not work for us and our workflow. So the next um, hurdle is really that there's some bias in how we're putting together our antibody panels. And we really wanted to find a way to have data really informing the markers that we were using. And so this project has been undertaken by Ferris, who is a PhD student in the lab, in collaboration with Chen Shin, a PhD student in Kieran Campbell's lab, and the PANCUREX team at OICR. And essentially what Ferris has done is she's taken published and new single cell RNA-seq from human um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, and she's resolved the epithelial cell type populations within that data. She's then gone through each of those clusters to interrogate the gene expression and found highly representative markers from each cluster and put those into her IMC panel. So at the same time, Kieran and Hart brought in Matt, who is a software developer, and essentially his job was to take Ferris and her approach and to put that into a web-based interactive software tool that could resolve uh, single cell or cell type clusters within uh, single cell RNA-seq data. And I'm just gonna let this demo very quickly run in the background. But essentially what you can do here with this app is that you can upload your own single cell RNA-seq data or one that's publicly available. And then you can use it to resolve your cell type populations of interest and then create a antibody panel or a reagent panel that's going to um, encapsulate all of that data. And so at the very end, once you interactively have put together your panel, there we go. Um, at that point in time, there is a machine learning based score that's gonna tell you how representative that panel that you've put together is of the original single cell RNA-seq data. And so if this is something that you're interested in, um, I highly recommend you give Cytomarker a try and then uh, please let us know um, how you find that it works um, in developing your own antibody panels. And so if we go back to Ferris's data, She's using the single cell RNA-seq informed panel to look at the epithelial heterogeneity or in spatial organization of single cells in human PDAC. And so you can see in these images that she sees particular lesions that are specific to one uh, cluster in her single cell RNA-seq data. So here, all classical two. Over here is all basal two. But she also sees examples where we're seeing multiple 
um, markers representing different clusters within the same lesion. And so we zoom in that on that. You can see that these hybrid tumors are actually quite abundant, and they're highly complex, expressing multiple different um, clusters within the same area of one lesion. She's also using it to define rare cell populations within her, her tissue that she was able to determine based on the single cell RNA-seq data. And essentially, when she finds these rare cells, because this is IMC, she still has the ability to then functionally look at what's going on in these rare cell types. There we go. Functional markers. And then she's also able to look at the microenvironment that surrounds these rare cell types. So onto our last hurdle is that, you know, we have all of this correlative data um, that we're linking with clinical things that are clinically relevant, but are we going back and really testing it after we find that? And so this was alluded to a little bit earlier in Dr. Quayle's talk, but you know, we're really wanting to go back and develop models to test this. And so there are two projects that are currently running in the lab. The first is by Dr. Eddie Chen, who is a postdoc in the lab. And when he joined the lab, he was given the, ta the task of essentially putting together a human, a matched human and mouse uh, immunophenotyping panel. And basically this is so that we could look at the immune populations in the human data and also those same populations in manipulatable mouse models. So he's gone through that same validation process that was discussed earlier. And so he's chosen his markers to identify his different immune cell populations and then individually gone and tested all and validated all of those markers looking for co correct co-expression and marker localization. He's then also put that together and looked at his different populations. So we have the leukocytes here on the left and the myeloid cells here on the right. And all of that has really been laying the groundwork for his actual project, which is to develop model systems to look at localized immune environments. And so how he's putting together these mouse models is that he is using introductal injection of lenti Cree into the mammary gland um, of mice that are carrying controlled expression of a particular oncogenic driver. So how this system works is cells that are infected are going to express the Cree. The Cree is going to recombine this lock stop locks, which is what's preventing oncogene expression. And so once that's been removed, we're going to get oncogenic driver expression as well as GFP. Now this is going to, you can control this with the amount of virus that you're infecting the glands with. And so this allows for the development of spatially localized lesions. And this is really important because if we want to see how the immune response is to tumor initiation, we need to do it when these lesions are quite small. And a lot of mouse work is done at the very end when we take tumors out. And so this model is really allowing us to look at the initial response of, of the immune cells to an oncogenic driver developing a tumor. And so if we look at Eddie's data, we're showing the ductal cells here that are hormone receptor positive in red. Anything that's green is an infected cell that's expressing GFP. And so when Eddie looks at his immune cells, you can see that in response to that oncogenic driver and tumor initiation, we get different levels of immune infiltration based on the different immune cell subtypes. Eddie is also working with SOMI, who is our computations manager in the lab, and they're working to develop analysis tools that really allow you to look at um, spatial features along with single cells. And so how they're doing this here is that in green we have the ductal cells, in red we have the immune cells, and anywhere you're seeing yellow that's actual infiltration of the duct, whereas you can see that a lot of the cells are actually just surrounding the duct. And how we've done this is anything that's within 50 microns of the duct. And so when Eddie does that analysis, you can see here that there's significant differences across genotype um, in terms of the localized immune environment. And so this top graph here is actually um, the cells that are surrounding the duct. These ones, this down here is the ones that are actually infiltrating. But obviously there's significant differences based on um, what oncogenic driver is, um, is active in the cells. And so these are just examples of how the ducts look. But the unique thing with Eddie's model is that we're not just seeing variability um, by changing the oncogenic driver. So in this model, all of these green lesions are being driven by the same oncogenic driver, but only this lesion, it might be a little hard to see, but only this lesion down here at the bottom, I'll highlight on, I'll highlight on both sides, um, is the only one that's actually surrounded by Li6G positive cells. 
So we're not just seeing heterogeneity in terms of the oncogenic driver. The response can also be different across lesions that are being driven by the same oncogene. So Eddie's model really allows us to look at one or two, the immune environment following activation of one or two oncogenic drivers. But what if we wanted to scale that up? And so that work is being done by Katie, who is a PhD student in the lab, who's co-supervised by Dr. Daniel Schrammick at the Lunenfeld. And what she's doing is she's taking a lentiviral CRISPR library and combining that with, with a protein barcoding system. And so these were developed in Brian Brown's lab and essentially are triplicate protein tags that can be transduced into the cell, detected with antibodies, and then you can basically debarcode from there. And so just as a proof of concept, Katie was able to infect cells with the protein barcodes and then detect her different, um, the different protein tags uh, using IMC. She's putting all this together in her model where she's essentially injecting her um, uh, CRISPR library uh, introductorily into the mammary epithelial cells and specifically into mice that are, have restricted expression of Cas9. So how this system works is that infected cell, I really like to not hit the right button there. So how it's working in her model is these, the, we have each construct has the triplicate barcode. It has a unique single guide RNA that's targeting a tumor suppressor or a non-targeting control, and they also express Cree. So any infected cell is going to express Cree. It's going to recombine the lock stop locks to give Cas9 expression. So only in those infected cells will we get um, knockout of the particular tumor suppressor. And so in this model, we're also going to get spatially localized lesions, but each one of these lesions is being driven by a different oncogenic event. And so on the right here, we just have her pilot data showing that she can inject this uh, CRISPR library into the mammary epithelial cells and get, uh, in, she can get expression of her various protein tags. So this is sort of you know, the things we're working on now, but where do we want to go next? And if we want to continue to push things forward, um, we, also, we don't just want to understand the biology better. We also want to look at, at questions that really can only be answered by using CYTOF. And so one such example that we started working on is looking at subcellular localization of isotope conjugated therapeutics. And specifically, we're looking at radionuclide therapy. And so this work is being done in collaboration with Dr. Sam Sadeji's lab at McMaster, and specifically his PhD student, Kevin. And so you can think of radionuclide therapy as being very similar to our conjugated antibodies. The antibody in this case is going to be directed against a specific tumor antigen, and instead of it just being conjugated to metals, it's conjugated to radioactive metals. So this is used in radionuclide therapy. It's also used in PET imaging. This type of therapy is approved um, clinically for use in uh, patients with prostate cancer. And so what Kevin has been doing is developing mouse xenograft models and then injecting this therapeutic to look at what happens to tumor growth. So it, he does uh, immunohistochemistry on his tumors to look for expression of that specific tumor ligand. And then obviously, after they get the treatment, they're radioactive. So our question was, once the radioactivity decays, are we able to detect any sort of residual signal from the radionuclide therapy in these tumors? And it's important to note that they're specifically using lutetium-177 here, which uh, decays to the stable daughter nuclide hafnium-177. There's also cold lutetium within these therapeutics. And so all of that is within our detection range using the IMC. So when we looked at tumors from untreated and treated mice, you can appreciate in this bottom image here on the left that this red signal is actually um, residual lutetium signal within uh, the tumor. This has not been detected with any sort of antibody. We've just kind of opened all the channels to see what we could find. We also ran an experiment where we wanted to compare how the activity that we could each detect using our different methods. And how we did this is that Kevin spotted uh, different concentrations of lutetium-177 onto an agarose coated slide, analyzed that by autoradiography, put them in a drawer behind a shield, let them decay for 10 half-lives. 70 days later, he sent them to me, and I did the acquisition uh, using the IMC. And you can see that we get um, good, we can both detect basically across the same range of um, activity, even though we're detecting different things specifically. So if we look at this sort of in a little more detail, um, here we're just using the PAN-CK to kind of define the tumor cells. 
But if we look here at CD133, this is the target of the radionuclide therapy. And then we look at the residual radionuclide therapy signal. We get strong overlap showing the specificity of this radionuclide therapy signal, that we do see some untargeted CD133 positive uh, antigen or cells. Because it's IMC, we can add in functional markers, and we've started to look at this in terms of the D levels of DNA damage and apoptosis that are occurring in these areas with the radionuclide therapy signal. So in the last amount of time that I have. I don't know how much that is, but uh, I just want to briefly introdu introduce uh, instrument standardization study that uh, we're just getting underway with in the lab. And so, you know, we've talked about clinical workflows and whether getting IMC included in, an, in, a, in a workflow is ever something that would be possible. And so kind of a, as a way to, as a first step to that, is we really need to have an idea of the variability um, from instruments to instrument. And so the, the study here that we're, we're essentially just showing uh, a pilot here is that if we were to um, take four sections of tonsil, stain them all with the same panel, and then I was to acquire one in the Jackson lab, and I was to send the other three to different facilities, in the end, would we count the same number of CD8 positive cells? And so in order to kind of get an idea of what the data looks like for that, we sort of has a, has a phase study uh, planned where we're originally going to do local acquisition um, of centrally stained tissue. So we're going to do all the staining in the Jackson lab. We're going to send it out to other labs to acquire predefined regions. And then we're going to get all that data back to compare across um, how many cells we can count within those different tissues. This phase is also probably going to involve acquisition of synthetic standards just to get a gauge of sensitivity from instrument to instrument. In the second phase, we're going to do local staining and acquisition. So we're going to send out unstained samples, and we're going to send out a cocktail of antibodies. And then you're going to do that. They would do the staining in the facility, and then acquisition, and again, send back the data. And all of this is going to be worked on using um, our rapid automated pipeline that's in development. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in taking part in, um, please reach out to me today or by email. Um, I, it was very key for, for me to point out today that um, Obviously, uh, machine time is money, and so we would be paying for any sort of associated fees as part of this study um, to see if we can get more people to join. So with that, um, being a lab that has only been around since COVID, we have no good pictures. So here is a, a Zoom lab meeting shot with headshots of, of new additions to the lab. But uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Hart for all of his support over the last three years and to really highlight Ferris, Katie, Eddie, and Matt, um, whose data I showed here today, as well as all of our collaborators and generous funding sources. I'd be happy for any questions. I wore Toronto Maple Leaf Blue for you today because I saw that comment in the, in, in the oh, app. Oh, oh, I was waiting. I was waiting. <laughs> I'm surprised uh, someone hadn't said something already. Because we're, we're, you know, we're kind people here in Montreal. Oh, oh. Are we're, you insinuating we're not kind people in Toronto? Wow, we're going to need a question. Somebody, anybody, question? <laughs> um, is there a question in the audience? Okay, there are some on the app. Okay. All right. Uh, for the cytomarker panel build, can you comment on protein versus RNA correlation? They're not always the same. Um, that's very true. And, and there's definitely markers that we sometimes see in the single cell RNA-seq data that um, you know, are not necessarily the chosen markers that we would use from protein. So I think that that's why they're developing it to be quite so interactive and giving you sort of a, you know, it's not making the panel for you. It's helping you make the panel. And so it's going to help inform to a certain degree, but also, you know, you need to keep in mind that sometimes data that's, you know, not found in the single cell RNA-seq data um, is still could be relevant um, at the protein level. So we are, we are aware that there are caveats to that. Next question. Uh, is there heterogeneity of immune infiltrates in your Lenti Cree model in relation to different mouse strains? Yes, yeah, so we do see um, a different response and sort of different immune cells being in those populations, as well as um, differing amounts of response. So in response to some oncogenic driver, there's a strong immune um, response, but not so much in, in other ones. So there is heterogeneity there within immune cell type and also with the amount of immune cells. Okay, there's a question, anybody has the mic? 
Where's our mic runner? Come on, let's go. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful talk. Uh, I am wondering, maybe you are not the right person to ask, but uh, since we have a lot of standard biotool folks around, <laughs> are there any plans or is it even possible to decrease the, the resolution to less than one micrometer? <laughs> yeah. I would also like that, so I'll, but I'll, let someone else, I'll let someone else answer. Yes, it actually is currently already possible, so speak with your FAS. There is a way that it can be done. Keep in mind, you will be trading off resolution for sensitivity, because you'll be um, acquiring less material. Uh, but it is absolutely something that can be enabled, um, so to speak with your FAS and something we can, we can talk about. But on your existing system, uh, it should be possible. So that, sorry, is that, so that's possible on like Hyperion, Hyperion Plus? XDI. We'll take one more question and then we'll go on to our next speaker. Um, very interesting work on the lutetium. I, I had two questions related, quick questions related yep. to that. The one was um, sort of how much uh, did you need in the, um, you know, uh, how much lutetium do you need to inject to actually be able to see? Like, did you look at the limits? Uh, and then the other question is uh, for the uh, spots, the uh, CD133 spots that didn't light up, um, was there any in interesting relationships to um, like vessels or other things? Like was there a penetration uh, problem with, uh, with those regions maybe? Yeah, um, so the first one is how much. And so um, essentially all of the different concentrations that they've done that have been safe to use in the mouse, we've been able to detect. Um, I will say that there are other um, Lutetium-177 is the one that they're using clinically um, with PSMA, but um, there are other radionuclide therapies out there. We haven't had as much success um, detecting those, but they also tend to be at the very, um, so I think it was, I think it was indium. So it, it uh, decayed to cadmium-113 or, or something. I'm probably getting those numbers wrong, but um, so we couldn't detect that one. And so there is definitely a, a sensitivity um, line there of whether you're able to detect it or not. Um, also with the hafnium. So those images are all lutetium. We're not able to detect the, the hafnium, and it may just be below our level of detection. Uh, in terms of the CD133 spots that don't or aren't positive, um, that's an excellent question. Um, so we definitely, it shouldn't be a penetration issue just based on how far the lutetium-177 can travel. Um, that should, it should be basically encompassing the whole, the whole tumor, but we definitely don't see the residual signal throughout the entire tumor. So there's still some, some questions there. And so, and in terms of proximity to different things, we're definitely looking at that now um, in some of that analysis that we're doing to look at um, density of the RLT, or the radionuclide therapy signal um, to various um, different cell populations. I, I've tried technetium 99 and wasn't able to see. So yeah, it yeah. is very much dependent. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks.